Well, for the first time in probably two and a half years, the local market as defined by its major indices has actually done something interesting, as proclaimed here by this little headline from the Australian Financial Review. Shares close at record high, real estate, tech jumps on rate cut bets. The issue here is that we had a change in the inflation numbers, and this gave some impetus to the market to actually move ahead. And if we look at the benchmark index of the S&P A6200 on a weekly basis, we see a few things. We see that from when I've got this chart started, 2014, the market meanders. And and this really is meandering. It is not a defined trend by any stretch of the imagination. You see the impact of COVID, the reversal from the COVID low, which was very strong and caused the market to lift dramatically. Market sets a new high or attempts to, and then goes sideways. And goes sideways for the better part of, let's say, two and a half years to be generous. With this week, we get a close above the previous high. So the first point I want to make is I tend not to get too excited on this simple penetration of a trend line. I actually want to see another bar beyond this point because at present all this has shown to me is that the market has spiked. That spike may well continue and that would be a good thing. But at present it is merely a spike. So despite the hyperbole, This actually does need confirmation. And if we drill down a little bit, we can see how the week's events unfolded. We could see that the market was testing this resistance. It punched through once, fell over, punched through on Friday. But you can see how neat the consolidation was for the local market. And what this reinforces in me is that the Australian stock market is not really an investment grade market. And I'll come to that point in a few moments. It is a special situations market whereby you look for special situations within given sectors, most generally the mining sector. And we've seen that with two particular commodities. We saw it with lithium two years ago, and we've seen it more recently with uranium. Outside of that, The Australian market has been very lacklustre. And I'll make a fairly blunt and dogmatic point. And I've spoken about this before. I've spoken about the distinction between Australian indices and their capacity to create wealth. If you're an investor in the ASX 20, 50, 100, and you're just an investor, you're not I'll use the word speculator. You're not someone who looks for opportunities on a regular basis. You won't get wealthy. It's as simple as that. But first, a little bit of background. And this is important to understand how indices are constructed. Because large numbers of people who talk about the index don't actually know how they are built. So the S&P ASX 200 index is a market capitalization weighted and float adjusted stock market index. I've highlighted the bit market capitalization weighted for a simple reason. That is the driver. The bigger the stock, the greater the weighting it has in the index. So it is quite possible to have heavyweight stocks not going very far, but giving the the impression that the index is performing. And that's simply an artifact of the way the index is put together. And so if you look at the best performers of last week, none of these are in the top 20. I don't even think any are in the top 50. And I would be surprised if a large number were in the top 100. But you can see there's some extreme performances as outliers. But when you look at the weighting of these stocks within an index, it's really quite small. We're talking about 1% and less than 1% percent for some of them. So these are quite small stocks. They won't have much of an impact upon the index in and of itself. Heavyweight stocks have an impact. And so we get these dislocations between the relative impact of stocks at either end of this capitalization spectrum. And as I said, this leads to some interesting dislocations. 
This is the performance of STW, which is an ETF over the A6200, versus IS, ILC, which is an ETF over the A620. And you can see that on a relative basis, and this is relative, ILC is a better performer over the longer term. But again, that can occur because you get very large stocks moving not very much. And by the same token, you get a large component of STW or the ASX 200 not going very far at all. And remember from an early video when I mentioned that the majority of stocks in Australia either go nowhere or disappear. Again, we come back to that rationale for it being a special situations market. So if we look a little bit deeper into the structural elements of what, what is happening, it, it's very easy to make pronouncements about markets making new highs. It's a little bit more difficult to drill down and to see what the underpinning of that particular move might be and what the context of it is. So again, we come back to this point I harp on relentlessly, this notion of context. What is the bigger picture? What happens when you step back from watching the little numbers flash red and green and you take, let's say, a 10,000-foot view of what's occurring? So this is the All Ordinaries. This is the broader index. 52-week cumulative, new high, new low. And this is a daily chart. So we can see the recovery from COVID. And we can then see that despite the fact that the index was going sideways, the number of stocks making relative new highs versus new lows was trending down. So more stocks were making new lows. Again, this is the problem with an index that is built the way ours is. I like to take a, a broader view. Same index, but a weekly chart. And I've highlighted two points. The, the first is the 2003-2007 bull market, which ended with the GFC. From my perspective and my argument, and my mind is yet to be changed by anything that anyone has said, the last bull market the, that occurred in Australia, and let me rephrase that, the last widespread bull market we had was 2003-2007. So we're talking about two decades ago. Since then, the market has meandered and there have been special situations. COVID was a special situation when a given sector popped. The online shopping and payment sector popped and gave us something. But since then, stocks have meandered. And this is interesting because if we look at the one-year performance of the ASX 200, uh, something like 48% of stocks have a negative one-year performance. So if we went back a year, bought them a year ago, we'd be underwater in terms of our funds. I want to take a little bit of a, a, a more detailed look. And often this is a metric that is often put up. And so we have a tablet here and we've got five charts. And they start with ASX 20, 50, 100, 150, 200, and it's the per percentage of stocks within that index which are above that moving average. And as you can see for all of them over this time frame, there is a healthy percentage of stocks within the index that are above their moving averages, particularly the 200, which is a longer term moving average, which carries much more weight, is much more important than the 20, which people refer to, and I do not understand why. Because in effect, what you're doing there is tracking noise and you're building friction into the system by tracking noise because you're missing out on what the broader signal might be. And in terms of interpreting these, when you have a high percentage of stocks above a given moving average, there are two things to note. You can get more stocks performing above that moving average, so the percentage goes up. But this doesn't mean that if, for example, you get to 100% of stocks above a moving average, that the index can't go further, because those stocks that are above the moving average can go further. You can be at 
max capacity in terms of the number of stocks above a moving average. And that really just means that the index is to some degree has its foot flat to the floor, but it doesn't mean the index must come down because the stocks that are above the moving average can continue to go up. And what I've done is I've just stripped out the raw numbers because they're a little bit difficult to see from those particular charts. And you can see there is a healthy percentage for all of them. And as I said, particularly the 200, you will often see, particularly in American sites, that they talk about the 200-day moving average. That effectively what they're doing is putting a long-term filter over price and everybody should do this. this. This nonsense that people have of looking at five and eight day moving averages, good for entertainment, not really good for profitability. And this is the point I made earlier. Indices are a little bit confusing for people. And they're confusing again because people don't understand how they're constructed. People see an index and they assume that every stock within the index has gone up. That's not true. It is quite possible for an index to double and the shares you hold to halve. This raises the question about so what as to this week's activity. And, and it is a valid question. So what? Market has attempted to make a new all-time high. Yes, it hasn't done that for two and a half years. So what? How, how does this impact your trading? How does it impact your strategic and tactical decision-making. Well, at the end of the day, if you're trading the index, it doesn't really matter. If you're trading the index via, let's say, the SPY futures contract, an ETF or a CFD, it doesn't really matter because the only decision you have to make is, are you long the index now, yes or no? Will you be long the index at some point in time, yes or no? And God forbid, you should never be asking your, yourself the question in times like this, why am I short the index? Probably because you're an idiot. But you need to understand that there is a differentiation between someone who trades an index and gains from the price performance of the index versus someone who has a portfolio of shares that make up the index. So there will be lots of retail investors who will be sitting at home and they will have seen a similar headline to the one I put up earlier on and they'll think, sensational, index has gone up, made a new high, my portfolio must be going gangbusters. When in actual fact, when you look at the performance of stocks in the broader index, that's not true. And as I said, if you look at the one year performance, the performance of the majority of stocks is really quite poor. So we come back to this point I've made before in previous videos. Within the context of the local market, you need to understand a few things. The Australian market on any given day makes up maybe 2% of world market capitalization. It is tiny. It is certainly dwarfed by European, US and Asian indices by and large. And you have to understand that that has an impact upon the opportunities that are presented to you. So if you're a portfolio investor, the market moving to a new all-time high is largely meaningless. Yes, it makes you feel better, but it does create a problem for the people who might be managing your portfolio because it means that by and large, their performance drops further behind the index because it's accelerating away from them. So the answer as to so what is, again, context dependent, whether you are a portfolio investor or whether you are an index trader. But there is a ray of hope for portfolio investors who might be caught in that trap of having underperforming issues. And that is that the moment people begin to talk about markets hitting all-time highs, the market attracts more attention. The moment it attracts more attention, it attracts more players. The moment it attracts more players, it attracts more price discovery. More players is better for everybody. And that doesn't matter whether you are an index trader or whether you are a portfolio trader. 